Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Republican Eric Holcomb and Democrat John Gregg are vying to become the next governor of Indiana. We sit down with both candidates and discuss pre-K education, infrastructure, and what they will do if a LGBT rights bill lands on their desks. Nothing that I've seen over the last year, in fact the last month, leads me to believe at this time that that will in fact happen. Do I think they're going to pass it in 2017? No. But I think by 2018, there's a real good chance they will. Indiana continues to fight against opioid abuse throughout the state. The governor's drug task force met in Scott County this week. Coming up, we'll check in with the task force and preview an upcoming documentary from our news team looking at the heroin epidemic in the Midwest. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. When current Governor Mike Pence uh, was chosen to be Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's running mate, his Lieutenant Governor Eric Holcomb stepped into the race. For the Democrats, John Gregg is vying for the job after a narrow loss in 2012. State House reporter Brandon Smith recently talked to both candidates. Nice to have you out of the State House and here on set, and you had a chance to talk with them. I do. It's great to be here, Joe. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Eric Holcomb only became the GOP's nominee for governor about halfway through the normal campaign cycle. And as a result, we've only recently started to see him develop and, and release his policy proposals. And even as you'll see here, he's still often short on specifics, as, is his, as in his answer to a specific question about how he pay for road improvements. We came out of the last session and we said we're going to, uh, as a committee, the first committee, as you allude to, uh, we're going to collect real information, real data, and this decision is going to be data-driven. We all agree that we want a long-term, sustainable uh, infrastructure program. Uh, we all agreed that we would keep everything on the table. And so I'll continue to, and I'm anxious about the product that comes out in December uh, from the first committee. Uh, and I have remained uh, one that has said, uh, I'll honor my commitment. We'll keep everything on the table and we'll inventory uh, where we're at, what our needs are, how much it will cost to address those needs and how much we can afford. And then we'll figure out the way to actually pay for it. But what I'm not for, what I'm not for is simply reverting back to those old days where we, we uh, far outkick our coverage, where we're just borrowing uh, away the future and um, leaving it for someone else to pay, where we're actually um, um, paving roads for 20 years, but we're paying for them for, for 30. Um, shifting to education, um, the state's voucher program continues to expand. There is no cap on it. Um, where would you like to see it go? I don't think that um, that options necessarily have to compete with one another. I think that they can complement one another and um, I want to continue to strive to try to meet that, meet that demand and not sacrifice. Um, I want to strive to have the best public school education system in America. Yet a lot of people feel like the continued growth of vouchers takes away from the goal of improving public schools. I just don't, I just don't see it that way. There's only so much money in a pot at the end of the day and we're all seeking to educate children, right? And we're all seeking to best educate uh, our children. And if a parent believes for whatever reason that there is an option that's better for them, why shouldn't they have that option? If it's all money going toward education and educating a child, why shouldn't there be that option? 
And on pre-K, um, obviously John Gregg has called for universal pre-K. You so far have said, um, let's just expand the existing pilot program. What does that expansion look like for you? As we start, we'll see the chamber. Um, we'll, we'll submit a study um, and a report, I should say, on how, these, how this pilot program is, is working. And I think that data will be incredibly uh, valuable as we um, continue to expand. I'm all in for pre-K. Um, and, and what does that mean and where do we start and how do we responsibly, um, certainly by saying it's universal and by low ball and the cost of it um, doesn't get us there. Uh, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the folks that want, that voluntarily want to put their children in pre-K uh, and start with the folks who can't afford it otherwise. If a bill comes to your desk as governor, that's the four words and a comma, the simply adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the state civil rights code. Would you sign it? You're giving me a hypothetical, and you're saying if, and nothing that I've seen over the last year, in fact the last month, leads me to believe at this time that that will in fact happen. Ever since this debate started, and I'm, I'm happy that for the most part the state and has moved on and forward and, and when it has come up the few times that it has um, and I've said this before it's almost it's almost out of exhaustion like are we are we having this conversation again so if it uh, gains steam and um, seems to progress we'll monitor it and that's what I've um, told anyone that's ever asked me about it. Well, on the flip side, Democrat John Gregg, who's been the candidate for uh, over a year now, he's introduced lengthy, specific policy proposals, as you can see in his first answer about his own road funding proposal, though many Republicans still don't like how he accomplishes it. We are living in a day and age right now. First of all, we're taking $500 million that Governor Daniels set in what he called the New Generation Trust Fund. The new generation's here. We can leverage that $500 million over a 10-year period to about $3.2 billion. It'll create 56,000 jobs. It'll help us make up that $300 million shortfall we have each year. And what people need to realize, this is not going to affect our bond rating at all in Indiana, our credit rating. Money right now to borrow is cheap. Now is the time to be doing that. There is some wiggle room in terms of the, the, the reserve level, obviously, but mm -hmm. the thing that Republicans uh, have sort of clung to is whatever the number is, we need to make sure we keep that AAA bond rating. How important to you is keeping that AAA bond rating and thus keeping reserves levels of probably at least around 1.7, 1.8 billion? I, I think it's prudent that we have that fund there. I think we need to keep that AAA bond rating. But by the same standpoint, it's like when I get criticized for wanting to fund full day kindergarten, a sizable amount of that money comes from federal tax dollars, your and I tax dollars. We've found the money Glenda Ritz and I have to implement full day kindergarten without a tax increase. We've found the money to incre uh, improve our roads and bridges without a tax increase. It comes from studying and understanding the budget. I want to talk about the idea of expanding to, to sort of universal, universal pre-K pre right away. Does it make sense to take that big leap into universal pre-K right away, or should it be a more gradual process? We talk about a three year, it takes three years to get to it, exactly for what you say. If, if we went out and found the money tomorrow to implement it statewide, we couldn't do it statewide, but we, we are convinced we can do it in three years. Obviously, there's only so much that the governor can do. We, we just saw a, a, a legislative study committee on LGBT rights with no progress, no attempts at compromise from either side of this sure. issue, and doesn't seem to be a lot of hope that something will get done. What do you envision you can do as governor? There's a lot I can do as governor. Number one, the very first thing I will do as governor is sign an executive order that will apply to members of the LGBT community that make up the 33,000 state employees, giving them civil rights protection. That's number one.
Number two, I will make sure that as we are working, and the state is a huge contractor, we contract with a lot of businesses, we will want to make sure in our RFPs and RFQs when the state's doing bidding is working with companies that have LGBT protections. When we are out trying to recruit new businesses to come to Indiana, we will want to work and make sure that they have LGBT uh, rights and recognize those civil rights. The fourth thing we do, and all of this is lead by example, because what these really are are quality of life issues. But the fourth thing we'll do is we'll mention it in our state of the state address. I will ask the legislature to pass it. You know, do I think they're gonna pass it in 2017? No, but I think by 2018, there's a real good chance they will. When you look at unemployment that's been nearly cut in half, when you look at all of these, these business climate rankings that, that put Indiana tops in the Midwest, near the top of the country, is it a hard sell then to say things aren't on the right track, elect me and we can get back on the right track? You know, it's not because you gotta scratch the surface a little. We have the seventh best business climate in the United States. We're 49th in new business startups. So what good does it do to have the seventh best business climate? It's because we're not a welcoming state. Um, why is our unemployment low? We lost in the 2008 recession. We lost jobs paying $20, $25 an hour and we've replaced them with $10 and $11 an hour jobs. Hoosiers are working harder and harder each and every day and they're not seeing anything in their paychecks. That's what we've had the last four years. We've had an administration focused on social issues and mediocrity. And Brandon, before you go, I wanted to ask you about Lieutenant Governor Holcomb just unveiled some of his first policy proposals of his campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Sure. He called it his economic development plan. It actually contained quite a few policy proposals. Uh, those included an, a $1 billion entrepreneurship plan, growing the regional cities initiative, uh, building a new port, a new bridge on the Ohio River, pursuing an all of the above energy strategy. The thing is, those are all ideas that came from Governor Mike Pence. Uh, Governor Holcomb's or Lieutenant Governor Holcomb's proposal actually contained 17 individual policy items and all but about two came from Pence's previous agendas. And as you said before, all this comes with a hefty price tag. How does he um, plan to pay for all this? Well, we don't really know yet. Uh, while his ideas were very specific, his funding proposals were not. He often said that he would go to the private sector a lot to get uh, funding dollars for his plans. Otherwise, he said the funding was just subject to negotiations with the General Assembly when they write a new state budget next year. And yet at the same time, he's also saying that he wants to maintain a state budget reserve of more than $2 billion. And then I'm guessing the Democrats then found, seized on that opportunity to um, criticize Holcomb then. Absolutely, you're exactly right. Uh, the great campaign called Holcomb's ideas uh, really more, nothing more than talking points with no way to pay for them. And the state party tried to use it as another way to tie Holcomb to Mike Pence, and specifically Pence's issues with LGBT rights. Holcomb, as we saw in that interview, his rhetoric hasn't really changed. He doesn't think there's a problem, and he doesn't want to talk about that issue. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon. Thanks, Joe. And now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana is among the state's challenging new overtime regulations. The rules are set to take effect December 1st. They require all employers making under $47,476 a year to be paid overtime. I, I don't think it's really a surprise. Uh, um, I, given that it was uh, controversial and this is a big change for some small businesses, I think it, it, it makes sense that some state attorney generals are going to want to challenge this. I don't give the challenge uh, much chance in court, though. Now, if the rules hold, the federal government estimates 87,000 Indiana workers will be affected. The Greater Greenwood Chamber of Commerce invited candidates vying for the 9th District Congressional seat to debate during a legislative luncheon. Republican Trey Hollingsworth and Democrat Shelley Yoder didn't mention each other until the moderator asked if the candidates would release their tax returns in the spirit of transparency. Yoder says she released her returns from the past five years. It does appear that someone has moved in just to buy this seat in Congress. We only have nine seats in Congress to represent the people of Indiana. And are we going to let someone just come and buy to the highest bidder, somebody from outside of Indiana? I want to fix our tax code. I know my opponent's obsessed with my tax returns. I'm obsessed with your tax returns. Let's figure out how to get to a tax code that works, a tax code that keeps companies here. 
And both Hollingsworth and Yoder say they won't participate in a planned debate at Franklin College because Libertarian candidate Russell Brooksbank faces a felony charge of third degree assault of a police officer. That debate was scheduled for October 5th. The man convicted of murdering IU student Hannah Wilson will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. A judge this week sentenced Daniel Messel to 80 years in prison. The judge also ordered Messel to pay Wilson's family restitution for funeral costs and lost wages. I think being able to say what I needed to say is what will help me move forward. Actually having the questions answered would be what I really need, but I'm not anticipating that I'll get those answers. 30 days to appeal his conviction and sentence. The completion date for the stretch of I-69 from Bloomington to Martinsville is now slated for October of next year. It was supposed to be done next month. Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton says people are frustrated. I don't feel confident yet that we're, we have a transparent relationship on what's happening. Construction was temporarily halted earlier this month after subcontractors walked off the job because they weren't getting paid. Work resumed this week. Legislators are working with researchers to study the effects of those living in the state illegally. Researchers testified during a study committee this week and some showed disappointment in the legislators' proposals. You know, they were talking about uh, Trump building a wall. Well, you know, the state of Indiana is building a wall within itself, and that's something that we want to remedy. The researchers called on lawmakers to provide driver's licenses and in-state college tuition to all immigrants in order to improve their situations. This was the fifth time the committee met. Up until this week, all of the meetings had primarily focused on the negative consequences created by people living in the state illegally. The United Way of the Wabash Valley is kicking off its annual fundraising campaign. The centerpiece of this year's fundraiser is a new child care initiative. The agency wants to raise $100,000 to improve child care facilities in the Wabash Valley. United Way leaders in Terre Haute say 60% of Indiana children are not enrolled in a high quality child care program. The new grant money would help pay for equipment, supplies, staff training, and enrollment expansion. The improvements will help providers move up a level in accreditation. As you move up a level, that ability to educate and get our children ready for school increases. So by the time you're level four, you have that superb training. The initiative provides $5,000 to $20,000 per child care provider for two years. It's the early years, you know, that are so critical for brain development and all other learning follows from that. So the experiences they get from attending a high quality program are crucial. The agency plans to begin accepting grant applications soon and will announce award recipients in the spring. And that early child education is so important, mm -hmm. but so expensive, Joe. So it I'm is. sure that's very needed. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. How bad is the heroin epidemic? Coming up, an exclusive preview of a new documentary examining the crisis. And you voted and the results are in. Coming up, we'll show you Indiana's winning license plate design. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Tim's. <laughs> there was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail. And the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life, and that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. 
Governor Mike Pence established the state's drug task force about this time a year ago. The number of HIV cases in Scott County was ticking up each day, and the pervasiveness of the state's opioid epidemic was just beginning to be realized. I say without hesitation, um, as much uh, as a dad, as a governor, um, it is uh, the scourge of drug abuse and addiction in the state of Indiana that has uh, impacted every community in this state, large and small. The task force has been holding community meetings across the state. This week it met in Scottsburg. The 21-member task force includes the heads of a number of state agencies, law enforcement, health experts, lawmakers, and judges. You know, we go over a lot of ideas. Uh, we express our frustrations as to why we can't do this sooner. But the fact of the matter is, uh, this is hard work. And I I'll say this also, um, you know, the era of big government is over, but there are some things that government can do and government can bring people together in these types of situations. Government can set up the, the, the outline, the framework to be able to deal with these kind of problems. And I think we should never forget that government just isn't this big entity. There's an awful lot of good, hardworking people in government agencies and county agencies trying to do the right thing. More people die from drug overdoses than car crashes each year. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in the U.S. CDC numbers show the number of deaths has quadrupled in the last decade and among the state's hardest hit, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. Now, coming next week, a special documentary from our newsroom, Finding the Fix, Heroin's Hold on the Heartland. I'm Sarah Whitmire, the News Bureau Chief at WFIU and WTIU News. And I'm Steve Burns, Chief Videographer for the News Department. Heroin is affecting communities, devastating families, and siphoning resources at an unprecedented rate. A new documentary from our newsroom, Finding the Fix, Heroin's Hold on the Heartland, takes a look at this epidemic and traces it back to its roots. We look at how it became so pervasive across the region, and we look at possible solutions that may stop its continual spread. Let's check out a preview. I mean, we use 80, 90 percent of the world's painkillers for a country that has a fraction of the world's population. I remember taking them the first time and thinking, this is it. This is just what I want to do forever. And I resigned to you know, the fact that I was going to chase this stuff the rest of my life, not knowing where I was going to get it. But, you know, I knew, I knew what it entailed and I knew what was in store for me. I'm filled with shame. I was expected to, you know, graduate high school and go on to college and pursue a career and have a family and have children. And, you know, becoming a heroin addict was not anywhere in the picture. Your brain is set up to experience reward and to remember what was rewarding and then repeat that action. Well, when you use the drug, it does the same thing. It'll turn on the same reward system with the same memories. The heroin experience is so much better, so much more rewarding so much more euphoria generating that the brain remembers that as the best thing there is. I think heroin, we've figured out that this is different than anything we've seen. Let's say we take out all the heroin in the world. Let's say this task force arrests everybody and there's no more heroin. What do we do with the thousands of people that are opiate addicts? So this is the problem we're having is this circle of every time we think of an answer, there's always another question. And the sad, sick thing about, about this disease is that, you know, I'm laying in a, in a a hospital bed and, and all my mind could tell me was get somebody here to bring you drugs, get somebody here to bring you drugs and I literally just died. Denial is an easy place to stay and unfortunately denial causes um, death from addiction, death from this disease. Our team has been working hard putting the final touches on the project which will air here on WTIU Thursday at 8 p.m. And then following the premiere, we'll have a panel discussion where we'll talk about federal efforts to combat the opioid epidemic and then how that will trickle down to the local level. Joe? Thanks, guys. And it's worth giving the date again. The premiere of Finding the Fix is September 29th at 8 o'clock. You can learn more about it on our website, too, at wtiunews.org slash findingthefix. 
The U.S. Department of Justice awarded nearly a million dollars to the Indiana State Police to fight the state's heroin and methamphetamine problem. The $950,000 grant funding comes from two programs, one anti-heroin and the other anti-methamphetamine. The money will fund more personnel, more resources for dismantling meth labs, and new equipment, including a sophisticated field test. Being able to have our officers identify drugs on scene without having to open them, touch them, or expose them to reagents, uh, color testing like we've normally done, this kind of uh, sophisticated equipment will be a great advantage and will be very, very safe for our officers. Turner says the state police will use part of the anti-heroin portion of the money to help underserved areas. And the Indiana Bicentennial Torch Relay is on. This week, the torch went through a number of places, including Bartholomew, Brown, Vigo, and Monroe counties. Its entire journey across the state is 3,200 miles. Live music, art, and a traveling exhibition called the Indiana Bicentennial Experience are among the festivities meeting torchbearers. You can see the torch this weekend in Union, Hendricks, and Wayne counties. The torch will continue its trek until October 15th in Indianapolis. And finally, take a look. This is Indiana's new license plate. Hoosiers voted and overwhelmingly selected this design. The covered bridge plates will be rolled out in January as older plates are replaced. And that's the end of this program, but more news online at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.